Hi there, this is Michael Leahy of the Irish Freedom Party uh, wishing you all what's left of the Christmas season a very happy and holy Christmas. I hope it went well for all of you. I'm trying out my new audio system with a smart mic tech, so hopefully it'll be slightly better than some of the audio quality that I have done in recent times. And hopefully I'll be, hopefully I'll be more listenable to on, uh, if you're driving along. I want to talk just about a few things today, not necessarily relating to Ireland. Um, the first is the presidential election in the United States and the ramifications of it. Of course, to any conservative people, the prospect of the American Democrat Party taking power uh, would fill one with, uh, with foreboding. Um, it's not a very pleasant prospect when you see some of the people he has lined up, President Biden, uh, elect Biden has lined up if he is in fact a legitimate president, which I'll come to later. Um, unfortunately, Joe Biden comes in what can only be described as a rather lengthy line of um, somewhat hooky uh, Irish American politicians. <coughs> Not a very happy thing for me as an Irishman to say, but uh, while many Irish American politicians have made a wonderful contribution to their country um, throughout their time in the United States, we have on occasion I'm afraid presented um, a somewhat fast and loose attitude to the whole issue of arrangement of votes and the corruption of votes. And I'm afraid uh, Mr. Biden has rather uh, a murky past, uh, which was of course covered up very effectively by the mainstream media in the United States during the election. And one's main concern would be his, his dealings with uh, the Chinese Communist Party, with the Chinese government, uh, whether he will in fact be um, beholden to that government uh, and possibly forcibly so. Uh, if that is the case, it's, it's a very worrying prospect for all who value freedom, democracy, liberty, uh, the rule of law. Uh, what's also evident is that there is very substantial um, evidence of malfeasance in this election. Um, it's not overwhelmingly proven, but there is certainly a sufficient case to warrant a, warrant a significant investigation. Um, going from the YouTube videos that one sees from reputable sources, there are certainly thousands upon thousands of sworn affidavits of significant um, malfeasance is the, the, the least one could describe it as in many of the, the important battleground states. <clears throat> And of course, it would be a dreadful end to the American um, experience of democracy uh, if it were to finally end with a, a dishonest election. Uh, and there's a great deal of evidence that this may be the case. Um, there's also a certain fear one must express that the American institutions have not been up to the job of properly adjudicating on what has happened. There is very substantial evidence of malfeasance, and yet the courts were not able to deal with it. Now, I know myself from having been uh, on a tribunal for many years that the whole issue of standing can be very important. But one can come to over-rely on the courts to sort out one's problems. And I think maybe that's one of the problems that has arisen with the American system. They have become over-reliant on the courts. And to some extent, this has led to the development of a type of critocracy or government by judges uh, to the point where, um, for many, the most important power which an American president has is that of appointing uh, judges, including Supreme Court judges. I think that shows the, the excessive power that judges have come to have in that country. And that's something one can never properly rely on. It's not a sign of a good or healthy democracy. Um, the question now will have to be asked, are there sufficient checks and balances in the United States system uh, to stop the Democrat Party from imposing um, totalitarian communism on their country? Um, they, have, they may well have stolen one of the most important elections in the country's history, and they may well continue to do so uh, and continue to steal further Senate elections, for example, and secure a complete majority uh, for their position. If they do that, then I think... Well, unfortunately, it may be the case that the game is up with the American Republic if that is allowed to happen. Um, so it's a very critical time, and many in the United States are advocating that the president should impose martial law. It would be an extreme step. 
But in the event that it were imposed purely to enable a proper election to be held, and provided the president, you know, the incumbent president, continues to act in a constitutional manner, and only allows the use of martial law powers to ensure proper elections, then I think it would be justified, I believe it is justified, on the basis of the information that the Trump team have already put forward. Now, whether that would lead to, uh, to a chaotic situation, whether the army would intervene, uh, I've heard suggestions that such a position might lead to a civil war. I don't believe that it would. I think if, as I said, the president acts constitutionally, um, demands a proper election, supervised by the military, because it is very clear another aspect of the, the American system which fell down was the manner in which individual wards and individual states were able to manage the way in which they, they, they held the election and do so apparently in a way which, was, which may have been dishonest and which may have put their fingers on the scales. And so as long as the president acts in a constitutional manner and makes it clear that the martial law will only be imposed for as long as it takes to hold a proper, free and fair election, then I think it would be a justified position. I don't think uh, there would. I don't think that the left side, while they are violent, and very prone to violence, they are not sufficiently armed to uh, provoke a civil war unless there is military intervention. Um, and I think it's also time for the right, the conservative faction, who have always held onto their guns and regarded gun ownership as very important, to ask themselves why they have their guns. Well. Their constitution allows them to hold guns so that they can prevent the emergence of tyranny from government. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether they will make use of those guns to ensure tyranny is not imposed, um, and whether they have, whether they really mean what they say when they insist on the right to bear arms. The second thing I want to talk about is the extent of COVID lockdowns and manipulation that we as a public are undergoing at present. Um, we have now gone into another state of complete lockdown. Uh, we were promised at the beginning of this um, process that the lockdown would be imposed in order to flatten the curve, to in, order, uh, in order to enable hospitals to catch up, to provide the ICU capacity they would need given the extraordinary virulence of this virus. Of course, it has not proven to be anything like that. Um, the levels of sickness and the mortality we're suffering is no more than a normal flu season. In any situation in the Northern Hemisphere, there will be substantial deaths uh, through influenza, pneumonias, etc. during the winter season. And it is no worse this year than in any other year. Of course, the denizens of the, the health related tyranny, and now suggesting that the reason we've got rid of influenza is because we all wear masks. And they're trying to ensure that this will become a permanent way for human beings to behave with masks, with isolation, uh, with social distancing, and with refusing to have social interaction. They have made no effort, and our health authorities have made no effort, to assess the long-term ramifications uh, from a psychological and from a health-related point of view before one even begins to discuss the appalling impact that this is going to have on our economy. One of the most ridiculous and one of the most preposterous statements that I've heard uh, coming from our government was issued by the leader of the Green Party just before Christmas, where he, apparently with a straight face, um, in issued a press release where he made the claim that there was a clear link between COVID-19 and climate change. Now, this is a level of brisness, <laughs> a level of extraordinary brass nakedness that I would have thought unimaginable. Um, this particular minister has advocated the, the re-importation of wolves into the populated part of the west of Ireland. Seems to think that would be a good idea. And without any um, effort to establish cause and effect, has suggested that the COVID crisis is related to the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And I think this um, reveals greenery, extreme greenery, for the sort of quack religion uh, which it really is. I think it also reveals the extent to which government 
is prepared to engage in psychological manipulation against its population. I often get the impression that we are subject to a very sophisticated psyop. Um, the introduction of fear, uh, the introduction of suspicion between people. This, of course, throughout history is something that governments um, of a, a less than benign stripe have persistently used in order to control population and in order to set uh, one group of the people against another group of the people to identify villains who don't go along with the narrative and um, suggest that they should be um, persecutors. Uh, well, we needn't go back too far in history, in the history of the 20th century, with its dreadful totalitarian regimes, uh, always involved the identification of an enemy within who would be persecutors. And I fear that what the government are now doing with their various crises and their justifications of the most egregious attacks against liberty and against our economy and against our basic dignity as human beings uh, will inevitably lead to uh, setting up of division between people in our society. And this will inevitably lead to a breakdown in social order. This is a very worrying thought. And you really wonder where this is going from an economics perspective. It is very, very clear that we will not be able to continue borrowing the vast sums of money uh, that we have had to borrow over the last year in order to prevent people going to work. Uh, the, the chief victims of this, of course, have been the small-scale private sector, uh, the person running a small business, a professional office, or um, a retail sales, or whatever, uh, who are uh, forced out of business for no reason. This is not, there's no benefit whatever to this. Um, there's a climate of fear created to justify it. People are paid, um, sometimes a, a reasonably good sum of money, but that can only continue for a very short time. It's very clear that the pandemic unemployment payments that we're getting now cannot be continued indefinitely and will have to stop. Many people, particularly lower paid people, are quite happy to continue with this arrangement because they're not doing too badly uh, for a temporary period of time. But when the whole thing stops and they have no jobs to go back to, when the small businessman uh, is no longer able to open his business because he's, uh, he has to continue paying his mortgages, he has to continue paying his credit card loans, and his business is no longer viable, what has, what has happened, in this, particularly in regard to retail, is that the big multinationals have come in and sucked up all the retail market. It was very hard to recover that market when people get used to buying online, when people get used to doing all their business online. It's very hard for a small local operative to recover the market um, after a lengthy period of time. And that is going to be extremely difficult to, to, to do once this, this racket comes to an end, as it will have to come to an end. Of course, we will also be left with a very huge headache in terms of, of a massive increase in national debt. And um, it really is a most, a most reckless position for government to take. Very difficult to understand um, how they can have made this mistake. Perhaps they, they made the mistake at the beginning in good faith, or perhaps they were getting orders from, in our case, the central powers of the European Union. I really don't know. But it is very clear that the Irish government has not been able to act independently for a very, very long time. And that's, that is a part, that is what happens to our mentality as a government when we are part of a supranational body from whom we generally take orders. We simply are not capable of making up our own mind, or simply not capable of analysing things. We must go with the herd, but we didn't go with the concept of herd immunity. But um, that is, is the situation we face now. The next uh, major challenge Ireland will face will, of course, be the attacks against freedom of speech. All these things are related. Attacks against freedom of association, attacks against freedom of speech. Well, there's obviously some big reset coming, and we hear about the Great Reset. We hear about the new normal. We hear about uh, building back better, that dreadful phrase. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a worrying time, but... Um, in many ways, it's good to be alive during this time of challenge. We have an opportunity to stand up and fight. While we still have the opportunity to speak freely, we must exercise it. In many ways, the, the loss of America will be a great, great loss if it does um, take place. And it's, it's looking increasingly likely that it will. Um, in the, uh, in the, two, the two things that 
guaranteed freedom for the West for so long were the, the beacon on the hill that was the United States and the spiritual beacon that was the Catholic Church. I'm afraid both of them are in very, very serious trouble. So <laughs> we may, we may as Christians and as lovers of freedom uh, be forced in, back into the catacombs, but uh, the victory is always guaranteed to the just. And we will have to have that as our consolation. So on that holy uh, thought, I would like to leave you. Uh, sorry for being gloomy, but um, one does like to end on a somewhat upbeat note. And I think that the victory will be ours in the end. Uh, this is Michael Leahy of the Irish Freedom Party. I would advise you to, to get active, get annoyed, get angry. Talk to your TDs about why you're destroying your business. If you're putting people out of work, you should be out of work yourself as a TD. I would advise you to join one of the resistance groups that's going up, in particular the Irish Freedom Party. We will fight for freedom of speech, for freedom of association, for an end to this um, crazy lockdown, uh, and for the maintenance of our democracy and our independence. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.